Well, Julian Fellows headed into your final season of Downton Abbey, uh, the sixth season. Uh, uh, are you working on that now? Is it already in production? It's in production. We're, we're, we're already filming. In fact, we're really halfway through. They're now filming the um, fourth block, which is seven and eight. But I'm also still writing nine. So we're still very much working. But yes, nearly there, really. Well, that, that number nine, that's critical. That's, that's the end. That's the finale. That's the one. That's goodbye. But so it is, well, it's, you know, it is quite demanding. You want it to be undisappointing and you want to tie up enough. I mean, either happily or unhappily, but resolve enough. Uh, and you have to get a lot done in, in a space of two hours. You know? Well, I, I talked to Graham Yost about his finale of Justified a few weeks ago, and I've heard Matt Weiner talk about Mad Men and other people over the years. It's it's one of the hardest things in the world, I think, for anybody in television to do because really no matter what you do, somebody's going to be unsatisfied. Well, I think that's a basic reality of anything you do on television. There's always someone who's going to be incredibly unsatisfied. So I don't think you should let that hold you back too much. I mean, the truth is, in the end, you can only do your best. You can only make the show, you know, that you want to see. That's, the, the for me, the kind of rule. I try to make TV shows that I want to watch. This final season, have you had some of the ideas for it and the basic structure for the, the absolute finale? Some of those ideas kind of roaming around in your head for years? Um, for, for quite a while. I mean, I think from about series four, uh, we knew where we wanted to end up with the sort of principal principal arcs, but obviously lesser stories and things keep coming in and, and sort of decorating it. And um, on this kind of a show, uh, on a British show compared to an American show, do you have the typical like table read on a given episode? No, we normally, we have a table read at the beginning of the shooting of this new series. And at that table read, we probably read about five scripts will be done and ready. But then as the filming starts, I will write and or do the next draft of the three remaining scripts of the series and the one special. Of course, in, in America, they're just shown all together as a single series, but we have a gap between November and Christmas Day when we show the two hour special. Well, because you write all of the scripts, are, is that one of the most important ways you know everything, you know, you know, if you want to make maybe make a dialogue change or a scene shift or something coming off of a table read like that? Well, I think, I think reading is very important. Um, and I, I think anyway, it's a nice kind of cohesive beginning to the year's work. And particularly if there are new characters coming in, they have the chance to meet everyone. Because inevitably, uh, you know, we shoot the, particularly the downstairs rooms and the staircase at Highclere, but we shoot all the kitchen stuff at um, Ealing Studios. So if you're only in the kitchen staff, you may never meet any of the Crawleys or whatever, or, you know, maybe once or twice in the series. And the read-through gives them a chance for the whole cast to get together uh, and meet everyone and generally feel part of it. So it actually performs a useful function in that way. And for me, I think it's always helpful to hear your own dialogue read and, you know, and to see, not to put too fine a point on it, whether or not it's working. Mm -hmm. And how do you know this is the time to end? I mean, what, what, what went through your mind to say, okay, th this, is, this has to be the final season? Well, I mean, funnily enough, we were really thinking in terms of ending on five. But as we got nearer five, we realized that we still had quite a lot of material to get settled. And we thought we needed one series that was basically about the resolutions of all these different uh, stories and so on. So in that way, we decided to do six. But certainly we didn't want to go on and on and on and on because we wanted, you know, to leave while people were still sorry to see us go. And uh, on that basic principle, six seemed a pretty good number. Now, in British television compared to American television, we, we sign our actors for longer terms, you know, six, seven seasons. I think over there it's more like three. Does, does that make a difference in terms of the numbers of years you can do a show? Uh, I mean, obviously, yes, because after three, you won't get another three years. You only get one or two years at the most. So all the time you're having to convince the actors that they want to stay with the show and all the rest of it. Um, and so I think it is easier to have a seven year show in America uh, on the sheer logistics of that. But nevertheless, even, even given that, I feel that 
four, five, six is about right for most shows. I mean, I know some go on and they're very good and that's great. But uh, for the majority, it's about right that they don't need to go off the boil. They can stay on the boil and then come to an end. And that's certainly what we intend to do. Now, from this past season, uh, we we're an awards website, so we love to talk about those sorts of things. I've been informed that from the writing standpoint, from your standpoint, you're submitting the uh, the next to last that we saw here, which was the Rose's Wedding episode. What 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 appealed to you about that one to be your writing submission this year? Um, I very much liked the performances in it. I felt that all the actors had done me very proud, but also I liked this storyline of, of the, the Rose marrying a Jewish man, because I've always been interested in that kind of almost subconscious, casual anti-Semitism that people sometimes aren't even aware of in themselves. They might be automatically, just slightly dismissively racist, just slightly dismissively anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, anti-this, anti-that. And it isn't like horrible people arriving with you know, hoods on with eye holes. It's just something more insidious than that. It slides into their normal behavior and they don't even know they're doing it half the time. And I think that is a real enemy out there. I think it needs to be recognized and identified and crushed in ourselves as well as in everyone else. And so it pleased me to be able to have an opportunity to put that into a storyline. And I thought the actors got it terribly well. So uh, I, I like the message, if you like. That's not too pretentious a word. I like the message of the episode. Well, and you pulled a real switch on us there, too. You had us all believing it was the, the uh, incoming father-in-law, when in fact the, the sort of villain of the piece was the mother-in-law. The mother of the bride. Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, funnily enough, I was talking to a Jewish friend of mine the other day, and I said, oh, well, I suppose we can say that stuff is nearly over. So we were talking about that episode. It's nearly finished. She said, don't you believe a word of it? So I'm afraid we still have a bit of a journey to go. Uh, even in nice civilized countries like Britain and America, you know, it's something we can't, we can't be too vigilant. We have to get rid of this stuff. It just holds us back. And, you know, one thing I've wondered, especially the last couple of years, as I knew you'd be winding up at some point, you, in the past of the main two characters of your show, played by Hugh and Elizabeth, it was the reverse. Uh, he marries a, a, a Jewish woman, or at least her father uh, was Jewish. Um, I've always wondered, might you do a prequel? Might we go back and see them in their younger days with different actors and see a younger version of Maggie Smith's character and, and um, Robert's father and that sort of thing? Well, funnily enough, I was once talking about screenwriting at something at the National, and someone said to me, would you ever do a prequel? Would you ever novelize the series? And I said, I don't think I would novelize, I hate the word anyway, I don't think I would write novels about the, the stories we've already seen, because I think they've already been told on television. I said, the only novel I could imagine you could write would be the prequel about how they met, how the, how he married her for her money and then fell in love with her, all of this stuff, which we know about. But anyway. By the time I got home, I had a message from my agent saying, we didn't know you'd written this novel. And by the time I woke up the next morning, there was an article saying the television version was already being cast. So I'm always a little bit nervous about uh, suggesting that it is possible. But I do think there might be a novel or a TV movie in Robert and Cora's love story, because I think we are quite invested in them now. And it would be interesting to see people like, as you say, old Lord Grantham, who we've heard about but never met, and his, um, uh, his mother, who is the one sort of terrible figure in Violet's life, was her mother-in-law, and we've never met her. So again, I think it would be quite fun, really. She could probably play her own mother-in-law. <laughs> now... I want to ask you a couple of questions about your past and the career, uh, your award-winning career, but is there anything at all you could tell us about this sixth, this sixth series, the sixth season that, that uh, would sort of tantalize people going into the summer? Well, I, I, nothing really. I mean, I never, I never do story, story revelations, but I mean, I suppose you can say it is the Crawleys and the dependents kind of resolving themselves and learning to face a different world, a world that was changing and going to continue to change at an increasing pace. 
which we do suggest. But I mean, I'm afraid that's all, really. I'm sorry to be disappointed. No, no, no. I didn't know that I would get much out of you on that anyway. Does it pick up right after the last special, or is there a time gap in between? Um, no, this I don't. I don't know that I've worked it out precisely. Not much of a gap. Um, you know, a few months, but that's all. They're now 1925. In the last, at the end of the last uh, series, they were at the end of 1924. Okay. Uh, just a couple of uh, past questions on your career. You're an Oscar winner for Gosford Park. You also won the Writers Guild Award that year. What, um, having won the Writers Guild a few weeks before, did you, I mean, what were your thoughts as you sat down in your seat that evening? Did you feel like you had a really good shot at winning? Well, all I can tell you is that when I was nominated, my agent said to me, it's such a shame you're in the same category as Memento. <laughs> and all after that, all my friends kept saying, oh, if only you weren't up against Memento. And so um, I went finally to see Memento, which was written and directed by um, Christopher Nolan. And of course, I wanted you know, to, to be sure that I was going to beat it. It's an absolutely fabulous film. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's an absolutely oh, yes. marvelous film with a marvelous script. So after that, I agreed with all of the people who were advising me that Memento was going to win. So I got my face sort of fixed in a kind of very good choice expression so that I wouldn't look too ridiculous when they announced Christopher's name. But then it was mine. So, it, so I was, in fact, very surprised to win, but incredibly pleased, as I'm sure uh, you will know. And I mean, the truth is, Christopher's about 400 years younger than me, so he has plenty of time to pick up several Oscars. Well, that's what's so crazy about voting for awards, and you're, I'm sure, a voter now on those Oscars, is you can't find two movies more different than Memento and Gosford Park. <laughs> I know, well, all the time you're trying to judge between an apple and a carrot. I mean, uh, that's just the nature of those competitions. And, I mean, I think on that level, uh, you know, being nominated is a, a prize in itself because you've been considered one of the best pictures of the year. And really, which of those nominated uh, is, is chance, really. It could be any of them. They're all good enough to win, or they wouldn't be nominated. So you just have to hope that chance falls on your team. You know? And when you're voting, is there, especially in a writing category, is there something in particular you're looking for that kind of that gauges your interest? It's very hard to answer that. I mean, some writing, just as you say, engages you and draws you into the predicament of the characters. And uh, I'm not very good at those films where you don't like anyone. I, I need to like someone when I'm watching a film. And I suppose you could say that tends to crop up in all my voting. But at the same time, I like very, very different types of films. And so I'm perfectly capable of voting for films that are really across the board in terms of genre or type. Um, I, I like writing where you don't want to look away. I like those films that grab you and, you know, you can't bear to, to go and make a cup of tea or to go to the loo or anything. You just want to stay with it. And those are the films that I enjoy. I love thrillers. I don't know how to write them, but I enjoy them enormously. And I very much admire people who can do that. You know, those real edge of the seat thrillers, I think are terrific. You've won two Emmy Awards for the first season of Downton Abbey, but when it was back in the miniseries category before they had decided to, uh, you know, to do other other seasons, um, what was that like just having the show? I know, I think from an international standpoint, having a show embraced, especially in a first season, after a first season, has got to be a real boost for everybody involved just to know that, that, that people like it. Sure, sure. I mean, you're quite correct. That the first the first season we had to model as if that was all there would ever be as if it was a miniseries and goodbye so the last scene was the announcement of the first world war and that in a way sort of thematically was where this way of life was headed and the war was going to come and change everything and so that could be the last season ever if that was if the last scene ever if that was what it was going to be but of course in the event i mean we did leave a couple of strings untied just in case we came back but basically that could have stood as a single unit. But then we had the very nice and warming feeling of being recommissioned, which, uh, you know, is always a very cheerful day, as you know. And now that you're finishing Downton, uh, we're all excited that you're going to do the Gilded Age. Is there anything you could tell us about that project? 
Well, it's a different, it's a different set of conflicts. It's, it's social, it's family, um, but it's about New York in the 1870s and Newport and all that new money arriving and those new families arriving to rather disturb the peace of the old sort of Dutch and English gentry families who had by and large governed New York up to that time. And suddenly these great fortunes of the Vanderbilts and the, you know, whoever they all were, the Whitneys and the Wideners and so on, descended on New York uh, with very different values and much less of that puritanical Edith Wharton good breeding and more huge palaces being flung up along Fifth Avenue. Uh, and every ball, you know, cost uh, roughly the annual expenditure of a small country, and all of that was going on, and it just seems rather an interesting time to explore, really, that um, American Renaissance. And what, what, uh, what decade or what, what year is that set in? Uh, well, really around sort of the early 1870s it starts. Mm, okay. Because and what, what kind of time finished. frame for, for us to see it? What, what, what's your timeline to produce it and then, and then uh, show it? I simply don't know the answer to that because I'm not the person who makes those decisions. When do you uh, when do you think you'll be going in, into production? Something like something like 2016, kind of a thing. Uh, yes, I hope so. By sort of late 2016, I would hope. Okay. Or maybe early 2017. I don't know. Uh, again, I'm not really the one to ask. Well, speaking of gilded ages, this is the golden age of television. There's so much good stuff on TV. And we're so appreciative of a Downton Abbey because it's 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 not like anything else that airs. And and good luck with the Emmy Awards this year. I think think uh, there may be some more in your future there. Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say. I think it's a wonderful time on television at the moment. There are many many wonderful shows, and and uh, you know, Mad Men, Good Wife, a Scandal. I mean, there are lots of favorites of mine. And I think it's actually uh, rather marvelous for us because timing, is, as you know, is not really what you're in control of, that we came along to be included in this very, very rich period of television. So I'm very happy about that.